Hello, hello, and welcome once again to another exciting broadcast of a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show that centers on what's going on in the world of the Beatles news-wise. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for my syndicated Beatles program called Every Little Thing, being joined by the man who writes for Beatles Examiner and many other Examiner columns, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. I can, and boy, this is an exciting uh, exciting week, let's put it that way. It's been exciting for quite a while. <laughs> yeah, but it really, it really got very exciting this week. Well, we are here to talk about, see, I don't know if you know this or not, but Paul McCartney has a new album out. No, really? <laughs> He's been hiding this from us. That, that he has. <laughs> Where has he been? I Doesn't don't know. show up I, anywhere. Yeah, you know? we haven't, haven't seen him at all. The album just sneaks out. No mention whatsoever. Actually, the album is called New. We've been talking about this for months. And uh, finally came out uh, yesterday. We're doing this show on October the 16th. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have been so eager to hear this new album. We've heard so much about it. I actually, and I think you did, Steve, you got an advanced copy probably the same time I did, about five yeah, days we both, ago. Yeah, we both, we both had copies, I think, uh, late last week. So we had it a few days before it came out. So none of what we're going to say here is, is like, is based on one or two listens. We've had time to, to sit and listen to it a lot in less than a week, but we've, we've heard it. Uh, and there have been tracks floating around too. Um, there were a few tracks leaked out. Parts of the album have been out for roughly a week now. Um, as, you, as we're gonna we're gonna get into all all of these all these tracks and and talk about uh, what's going on uh, before we get started, we should mention and everybody knows that there are four producers. Mm -hmm. um, Giles Martin produced most of the tracks. Ethan Johns. Yeah, Ethan Ethan Johns. Uh, 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 well, let's start with Ep Epworth, uh, Paul Epworth is on uh, Save Us, Queenie Eye, and Road. Mm -hmm. Mark Ronson did Alligator and New. With additional production by Giles Martin, which I think is kind of interesting that they mentioned that. And Johns did Early Days and turned out again with additional production by Giles Martin and Hosanna. Right. And then Martin did the other the other seven and, uh, and the hidden track Scared. Mm hmm. And, and I you're, believe you're he talking also did about the. You're, you're, I was going to say, I believe he also did the Japanese track Struggle, too. Okay. Which well, we aren't really going to get into, but. It is there. Right. And you're referring to the deluxe edition. should make that clear. Yeah, we're talking about the deluxe edition. Um, the standard edition cuts it off on at Road. Road. There's only uh, a 12 tracks. There is still the Scared is on the, on the standard edition as well. Scared is on every version. It's right. a hidden track. It's just not listed on the packaging. Right. And then the deluxe edition, for most versions, has an additional two tracks. Plus scared, mm -hmm. and then there's the Japanese version that has the song struggle. Right. So all together, the most that's been released so far, and if you had, well, you you need the Japanese version would be 16 tracks. And Bob Gannon did a little detective work on the ASCAP uh, website and found that there were some songs by Paul copyrighted with work numbers close to the new tracks. And I don't have the, the the list in front of me, but there were I believe he found six, and I found one more. So there are possi there's possibilities of more tracks coming out down the road, and str and struggle too. Well, but, we we heard at the very beginning that there were a total of twenty one songs. So I don't know how accurate that number is. That gets pretty close to twenty one because yeah. it was uh, yeah actually that's over twenty one. So if we if we go by the the I believe the five tracks that that uh, Bob found and the one I found and struggle so but we'll see what happens well I mean obviously you know anything can happen down the road but there is possibilities of more tracks coming out right. let's get to the let's get to the um, let's get to the individual songs well why don't why don't I just get your impression overall of the album and then we'll pinpoint the tracks you want you want you want to do that first yeah um, why not. Overall, I'm I'm quite I'm surprised. I'm surprised it's so good. 
I why, honestly, why would you be surprised? Why do you word it that way? It exceeded my expectations. I really did not expect it was going to be strong, as, as strong all the way through as it is. I expected, after hearing new, I was, as I've said here before, I was very, very taken with new. I still love new. Mm-hmm. I enjoy listening to that quite a bit. Queenie Eye, I wasn't, when when they conquered, uh, uh, released Queenie Eye as a single, initially my reaction was, well, I don't know about that. Then I listened to it a, a, a little bit, and I listened to it more and more and more, and that's grabbed me, not as much as new. The thing that the thing about Queenie Eye is, we got to hear Save Us and everybody out there from Paul performing it. Mm-hmm. So we knew those songs anyway, and... I instantly thought that everybody out there was so damn catchy and Save Us is such a great rocker. And I heard Queenie Eye for the first time and I thought, this can't be a single over those two songs. But Actually, I disagree with you on everybody out there. When I heard him do it from the iHeart Festival, I did not like it. I thought it was really, I, I, I don't know, it just was too obvious especially doing it live, to say, everybody out there, everybody out there. And, you know, it's like a call and response. Like you're really trying to, you know, it's like, all right, everybody clap your hands. Well, I mean, uh, Paul McCartney doesn't need, in my estimation, to do that. And I really didn't wasn't taken with the song live. Then I heard the studio version, and I went, oh, not not so bad. It sounds much better <laughs> studio. And, and, I, and, and, in fact, the live versions so far have not uh, really been, you know, all that thrilling to me. The exception for live versions was the Sinatra show, which I thought, and we were talking about live shows last week, the Sinatra show sounded wonderful. Uh The mix on that was absolutely incredible. And somebody, at least a couple of people said, I hope they release that, and I have to throw in a vote for that. It really was amazing. I don't know. Did you hear that? Did yes, hear I watched that? it. I watched it. I was very impressed. Watch, I didn't by watch it. I heard. I just heard it, uh-huh. and I was, I was absolutely stunned. It was great. Well, uh, in case anyone's wondering what Steve is talking about, there was um, a special event that took place last Wednesday. It was actually on John's birthday, Paul and Nancy's anniversary, October 9th. and it was in Queens at the Frank Sinatra School of Music. And Paul did part Q and A, part performance with his band, and this was at a a fame type school, kind of like Lippa Paul right. School in, in Liverpool, and all all the um, all the people in the audience, they were all high school students. So, to me, first of all, the business side of me is saying this is a brilliant move. <laughs> you know, he's performing songs, new songs, plus his classic songs in front of young people. He needs to reach out and always get a new audience as best he can. This was an absolutely brilliant thing from that perspective, right. and the questions were very good coming from high school students, but I could not believe, and you have to watch this, Steve, the kids in the audience knew the Beatles stuff so well. Right. They're they singing were, yeah, along. They were singing, they were singing along. Yeah. They we can work it out. They were singing along with that. They were, their hands were swaying to the sides with Blackbird. They were singing along with um, Hey Jude. They knew Ben on the Run. The Something fact about an audience of, ki- of kids that appreciate your music for being music, if if I if that sounds right, but that's exactly what was happening here. Yeah, and and they were the perfect audience to play to play at uh, play for. And uh, boy, that was a, it was a great idea. I actually, you know, when I heard they were going to show this, I was kind of going, why? You know, it was a private thing. It was just a little group. They're going to have questions that are going to break up the music. What's the big deal? But it actually it was much better than I ever thought it was going to be. Right. But it was such a heartwarming thing to know and to watch these kids in the audience. And, and they're just, they idolize this man. They did. Just the fact that they know who he is. And I know that you're saying, well, you know, he's a legend, he's a Beatle. But still, you know, these Beatles songs that he's playing are 40, 50 years old. Right. <laughs> and these kids know it. Yep. And it's just, it, it, it blew me away to watch this. Yeah, and like I mean, I think I think a lot of it, or at least part of it, had to do with the fact that these kids were music students, and that's right. You know, that's a big that's a big thing. Though there's a you know, it's not just you know playing in front of any group that doesn't that may appreciate the music for what it is, 
but not the technical aspects. These kids knew what you know knew what was going on there. Right. So. But anyway, um, I have to disagree with you totally about the music there because I think that Save Us and everybody out there, it's very obvious why those songs were chosen to do live. They're meant to be done live. They're well, really, they're really, you know, I think when Paul does rockers, they translate very well live. Right. No, and, and I, I, agree, I, I understand that completely. I'm just saying that the initial live versions from iHeart and from, from uh, Kimmel were not as good. Maybe it's because it was the first time they were doing them live or whatever, but they really didn't come over very well. I think the, I think the, the Times Square version was better. I can't re- recall the Sinatra version off the top of my head. But I think as they do these songs, you know, it'll work out a little better. But I think initially they just didn't come off very well. But the, the live version of Save Us comes off very well. It's, it's, it's very strong. Uh. Well, I think at the iHeart Radio Music Festival, I think Save Us really smoked. I completely okay. disagree with you. But hey, right. so the album. Let's go on with the album here. Um, I I I think there are there there are at least well, there's one or two songs that uh, are not um, as great as the rest of the album. But I think um, for the most part, all the songs are very strong. A couple of them are incredibly strong, and I think there will be a few, maybe more than the usual number, that will last uh, past the the time, you know, past the usual time um, frame of this album. And that's really the big thing. And you and I have talked about this about what, how much radio is going to pick up on this, and whether you know this album will, will have legs. And I think it will, to a certain extent. So. Well, we'll see. I mean, we'll right, see. we're going to save that for another show. Yes. We Let's are. just talk about the songs here. Okay. The, the songs that that impress you the most on this album would be which ones? Queenie Eye is one. New is another. And in, in the when I wrote up my track by track review, uh, New is the only one I gave an A plus to because I really think it's fantastic and it also sounds good when other people do it. So. Hmm. Um, okay. Appreciate is another one that I really like. I can bet. I, I really like I can bet. Mm, so do I. <laughs> um, and I oh I, excuse me I, I take that take that back about the A plus remark. The other A plus song I, I gave was um, Get Me Out of Here. I really really like that just for the the uniqueness of it and um, and and just uh, it's it just a great song just a fantastic song. What's so, like, what's so unique about Get Me Out of Here? He sounds like an old blues guy. <laughs> somebody, some, somebody online called it a dirty song, and, and that's a good description, too. But it just sounds like a, you know, he's like a busker, and it's a great, exactly. I think it's a great song. I, I really, I mean, I was just totally taken with that song. And I really thought it was a shame that it's only on the deluxe. That would have been, I think, but... There's a reason to get the deluxe because it's such a fantastic song. Here's one case when I agree with you, because <laughs> uh, oh, I'm I'm certain I'm going to agree with you on a lot of levels here. Okay. But, but get me out of here. On the one hand, can sound like it's something that Paul could write in five minutes, and at the same time, I can just picture him on a street corner, or at a train station with a guitar case open, <laughs> mm-hmm. singing it and singing blues. And it's even a little bit distorted his voice. Right. So it even gives you that feel like you're you're. When when you see people who are busking or doing this, the sound quality is never that great to begin with, usually. Mm-hmm. So it gives you that feel. So I kind of remember, like, and give my regards to Broad Street when Paul was singing yesterday, <laughs> and he was busking as he was doing it right. and taking people, you know, throwing money at his guitar case. Right. It made me think of that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a nice little surprise at the end of the deluxe edition. Yeah, it really is. It It, it really is one of my, as I said, Again, when I wrote when I wrote it up, I said it sounds like it was fun to record because it's a lot of fun to listen to, and it really is. Mm-hmm. So. What is it? What is it about uh, appreciate that you appreciate? <laughs> I think the chorus, just the the the, the 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 rhythm of the chorus and the uh, the way he keeps singing it over and over again. I, I I think I think that's what I like there. I mean, what do you what do you think? I like it. It's got that kind of a, a dance feel to it, mm-hmm. more of an electronic feel. 
And Paul's done that upon occasion in, in his career. It's one of the songs that maybe could have been on Electric Arguments. Same thing with uh, Road, which I believe is probably the most experimental track on the album. You know, that, it, that's an interesting thought because my when I was going through my evaluation, I said, th- I thought this album stayed pretty removed from The Fireman. I mean, there's a couple of moments, and obviously Struggle is one of those. That is very firemanish, hmm. uh, and that's probably the most firemanish of all of them. And obviously, that it's not something the American audience is going to hear because it's not on the American CD. But for the most part, anything else that borders into that territory is fireman light. It's not. It's not heavy, uh, edgy. He basically stayed within the brand, within the Paul McCartney brand. Here. Oh, don't use that word anymore. <laughs> Don't ever use that word. <laughs> well, he did. There is no brand. Paul McCartney is musically diverse. He's all over the place. He is is, that, is mu- that his brand? He is musically di- diverse, and he is all over the place. However, he has a border, and he know, and he he knows where to stop. Oh, and I don't I, know. I I disagree with you, you completely. You? Yeah, I do. You know, I, I, I do I think it was wrong, as we have said before in past shows, that he called Electric Arguments a Fireman album, because to me it is a Paul McCartney album. I understand the approach that he took with Electric Arguments and that all the songs he made up on the spot with youth in the studio from scratch. Mm-hmm. So because of the concept and the approach and how different that was, that made it a very different album in its own way from other McCartney albums. But stylistically, there there are times when... I can go back to songs from 1970 from the McCartney album, Karina Crory, <laughs> something very experimental like that, or stuff from the McCartney 2 album, bonus tracks like Secret Friend and Check My Machine and stuff like that. That's the same, it's the same field. <laughs> it's experimental. It's Paul going, you know, a little bit, not in a pop mold like Band on the Run. Right. Venus and Mars, those albums. It's it's stretching. It's going beyond what is expected of him and playing around with different styles and musical instruments and sounds. You know, Paul, as far as I'm concerned, and I love the whole Wings period, don't get me wrong, I think he experimented... We know, we know that. No, we but... Know, we know that. But I think that he grew in leaps and bounds as an artist after Wings because... I'm sure he did. Yeah, because he, he experimented did. more and worked with different people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so when I hear something like The Fireman and there's a song like Sing the Changes, I don't consider that to be so radically different from things that he's done before. I really don't. I don't think that, it, I don't know if you want to say radically different, but there is, a, there is a difference there. There's no question. And there's no question that the, that kind of stuff would not have worked on new. And it, and it didn't because... Well, I... I kind of look at Road as being sort of, you know, that would fit into electric arguments. No, I don't. I don't. Struggle is the only thing that I, that I would even put close to, that I would put in electric arguments, and that, and that is a definite. Huh. There's no, there's no question to me that struggle would have fit very nicely on electric arguments, but, but uh, none of the none of the tracks on new, I think everything gels pretty nicely, with one exception. With one song exception, which is Hosanna, and that's the one that most everybody uh, that I've seen has picked out as the one they don't particularly think works very well in the context of the album. Oh, I don't know. I just see it as another acoustic ballad. You know, I just, I think it works very well. I think if it, if it if it had been arranged a little differently, if um, it might have worked a little better. But I believe if if I recall, that one starts with a little bit of psychedelic sound effects and then goes into you know goes into the melody and then comes out with psychedelic again and it, it just didn't appear to work for me but who knows maybe some, in, at some point i will grow into that one but um hearing it uh it did not uh did not make a lot a uh, good impression on me hmm. okay another issue and, and i'm going to take this in, in another direction is early days uh-huh um the lyrics to early days are very much Beatle related. Oh, obviously, it's all about the Beatles, right? <laughs> and right. and it, it's it's 
a subject that hits close to home mm -hmm. because I think about all the people who are out there who are Beatle experts or Beatle authors, mm -hmm. and they write things about the Beatles, and some of it is either not fully corroborated or it's opinion, and it spreads like wildfire, and it's not based that much on fact. And Paul gets to see these things from time to time, and, you know, he just wants to bang his head against the wall. Like, why is this stuff written when he himself lived it? And right. so it's a completely different perspective, you know? And well, let me it's, 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 it's very different when you look at things from a historian, for, from that kind of point of view, as someone who's collecting information, reading as much as you can, trying to get as much accurate information as you can. Compare that to someone who lived it day by day. Right. Do you think and, he was talking to anybody in particular? Um, well, he has mentioned, he's brought up Nowhere Boy when he's done interviews. Which I think is a very, very uh, good um, discussion point, because, as, as I think we've said, um, I did not think Nowhere Boy was that, was that great a, a film. I mean, it was a good story, you know, but I don't think it was the be-all, end-all that, that the hype made it out to be. And I said that at the time, and I still believe that. Right. Well, Paul has said that he, I don't think he ever really saw the film, but he read the script, and he felt that Mimi was not portrayed well, that she was a strict person, but she wasn't a cruel person. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about that when we had Tim Riley on, on yeah, the show. Yeah, that, that's right. I you think know? he did see it, actually. I think I remember he was given an advanced screening, and he was not real pleased with it. He said that John never jumped on a bus. John never physically had a fight with Paul. You know, and he reads these things. And, you know, he's just baffled. You know, why is this stuff being written? So he, he's going by his own memory, and his memory will always be valuable. You right. Know, it may not always be accurate because, let's face it, he is human. He can't remember everything that's ever happened in well, his I mean, life. Look at how old he and Rinko are. I mean, they're not going to remember everything. And even within the context of the anthology, there was some disagreement. Right. So, you know, what can you say? Every now and then I come across people, whether they're people who host Beatle programs, or whether they're fans, who seem to think they know more about the Beatles than they do. <laughs> yeah, that's a, you know, that's a real interesting thing to, when you have to deal with people like that who, yeah. who think they know everything, and, you know, I, I'm going to be the first to say that I'm not perfect. God knows everybody, you know, I've been told that many times, but I, I'm not, and, um, you know, I don't know anybody else who is. And, you know, it's interesting to try and pin down exactly what happened. And, you know, you can guess all you want, but, you know, you weren't there. And uh, and I was, I'm not mean you personally, but, I mean, people who weren't there, you know, really don't know. Yeah. Well, I even read one review of New where the writer actually said that if you want to find information about the Beatles, the two people that you should talk to the least are the ones that are alive. I read that. Wow. So wow. when you get to that level where there are people out there who actually think they know more than they do, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are people that, you know, I'll always, I'll always want to talk to knowledgeable pe Beatle people, but you have to have respect for those four people and right. their point of view and the way that they saw it, no matter what. Right. Anyway, so uh, just overall, I'd like to tell you my opinion of New. <laughs> Yeah, I've been doing a lot of the talking here. Go ahead. Um, overall, I think it's an ex a very strong album. Mm -hmm. As what happens every time I listen to any McCartney album or any solo Beatle album, and I listen to it a lot, all all at once, the songs stick in my head. Certain ones do more than others. Mm -hmm. Certain ones I like instantly. Other ones take more listens. And there's no way on earth that I couldn't fall in love with Save Us the first time I heard it. I thought it was just such a great opening track and a great rocker. And, you know, it, it's been a while since Paul has opened an album with a rocker. Mm -hmm. You know, an original rocker. I mean, not going back to uh, the Russian album or, or um, you know, Run Devil Run or those albums, but right. of his original stuff to open an album with a rocker. I love the fact that he did that, and it's a great song to do live. And like I said, I think the band smokes when they do this one. Alligator, I love. I think that's a very different sound for him. The structure of the song is a little bit different. I love the whole arrangement of it. Mm -hmm. And how he alternates between his real voice and his falsetto voice, I like the use of that. 
it's a very different song. It's, um, I would definitely uh, call this album a very fresh sounding album. And I think you have to give a lot of credit to the producers that he worked with because I think that had a lot to do with it. I think that the, you know, everybody questioned when the, when word got out that he was going to use four producers whether it was going to work, and surprisingly it did. And you really have to credit Paul for that. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, because uh, that's really where it all came together. I mean, he put the, you know, he he got the, uh, you know, all the songs. You know, work right. Um, Giles did a great job overall. I mean, obviously he was the supervising guy on this thing, but Paul's strength held held this thing together. I don't know that anybody else could use four producers, four disparate producers like that, and had and get the same result. Right. Well, we had said, and I know I brought this up uh, a few shows ago, that it reminds me of Flowers in the Dirt in that respect, because he'd had a lot of different producers working with him on that album. And you really can't tell from one song to the next whether David Foster produced a song or Mitchell Froome produced a song Mm -hmm. with Paul. Same thing with this album. It's not like, you know, unless I looked at the credits, I couldn't tell you a Paul Epworth song from a Giles Martin song from an Ethan John song Mm -hmm. from a, from a, a Mark Ronson song. So, like you said, give Paul a lot of credit for that. Queenie Eye is a song that I've grown to really love. It took me a few listens, and um, it's a great rocker. It definitely is. But going back to my original comment about when I first heard it, and I was Mm -hmm. told that would be the next single, I still think, because everybody out there is so damn catchy, (laughs) I still think of that as probably being you know, the most logical choice for the next single. But Queenie Eye has got a lot of edge to it, very piano-oriented. I love the the Mellotron intro at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously you 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 think back to the Beatles, you think of Strawberry Fields when you think of a Mellotron. And I love that he used the Mellotron at the intro of of Queenie Eye. Um On My Way to Work is the song that is one of the few that to me doesn't grab me that much. It kind really? of it kind of plods along. Mm-hmm. Although it it may The whole who idea knows? of Paul talking about going to work is just is is tough to to grab onto. As far as I, as far as I goes, as far as I go, um, did you pick up the strumming guitar that sounded like every night in there? Because that was the first thing that caught my ear. Um, there's a guitar strumming in there that sounds straight out of every night. Hmm. I never thought about that. I have to go back and listen. Mm-hmm. But um, the early days, I think, uh, is a gem. I think that's one that really works, and it's something that's heartfelt, and I love the fact that Paul's getting personal, and he's saying what we just discussed mm-hmm. about how people talk about his life as, as though, you know, they know more about him than, than he does, right? or how it, was, how it all happened. New, after several weeks, I think is just an absolutely perfect song, and mm-hmm. I love everything about it. It does remind me more and more, if we, we talked about the, the Beatles songs that it reminds you of, probably more with Penny Lane than any other Beatles song. I, you know, one thing I tried not to do was compare this album to the Beatles. Um, no, but what, what I'm trying to get at is just what it reminds me of. I'm not comparing it. I'm not well, saying it's better or worse than Penny Lane. No, no, I'm just know, saying it I reminds mean, me stylistically of Penny Lane. Mm-hmm. No, I just tried to, I tried to evaluate the album for what it was and not try to, uh, with the exception of, of uh, the song, you know, the other song where I talked about uh, every night only because it was, or because uh, it was there, it grabbed me. But I tried to just evaluate the songs for what they were, you know, because but you know, that way you end up getting into all these things about, you know, Beatle comparisons and stuff. And and for me, it 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 uh, it puts too much pressure on the new song. So I, I that's but I'm I'm not comparing them. Okay. I'm just saying it reminds me of, and that's going to happen, as Paul has said in interviews. Okay, he has his own style. There are going right. to be times when he puts out a song and it, it might remind you of a wing song or it That's might right. remind you of a specific... That's who he is, you know? There's right. something that, that you he... will hear that maybe someone else won't hear and it will remind you of a previous song. And that's completely normal. Yeah, that's what he said you know? on the, in the German interview he did the other day about, about that. So It's like one of the songs that I like a lot on the album is Looking at Her. Mm-hmm. Looking at Her is very much like It's Not True. And I, I, I can just tell that you're not connecting those two songs. But no. It's Not True, which, for those who don't know, was a song from the Press to Play sessions. There were two versions that came out, and one of them was the B-side of the single press, and then there was one that was a bonus track on Press to Play. And 
the one that I've always loved the most was the B-side of Press. And it starts off with this soft vocal, uh, falsetto, I believe. Yeah, it sounds like a falsetto voice. Mm -hmm. And then, later on in the song, gets very heavy, you know, in the song. Right. And there's, you know, the guitars come in, and it's a heavy part of the song. Then it goes back to the soft part. Then it goes back to the heavy part. It's the same thing with Looking at Her, which starts off with, certainly sounds like falsetto vocals from Paul. And then the song gets heavy later on. Mm-hmm. You know, when he sings, I'm losing my mind, and then all of a sudden it kicks in like that. And it reminds me very much, stylistically, mm-hmm. of It's Not True. Nothing wrong with saying that. No. Um, no. Appreciate sounds very fresh. It sounds like a dance cut. I'll, like, I'll, I'll go along with that. It does, it does sound very fresh. Everybody out there I like a lot because I love the sound of the song. It's so catchy. And just the part where Paul's singing, There But For The Grace Of God Go You And I, it's so McCartney. It's a, you know it's such a great hook right there. When you hear that, you know it's Paul. It's like and it's interesting. Like, interesting part on that uh, song is that the CD says the McCartney family chorus is on there. Hmm. Would love to know who, how many, how many people. And plus, there's a string section too. But I would love to know who who is in the background on that one. Right. But that's just, it's such a damn catchy song. You know, it's mm-hmm. one of the things that he can write with such ease. Hosanna, I like. It's a nice ballad. It's going to take a, a little bit more to grow on me. I That's can, what a lot of people are saying. Uh, that Hosanna is one of the songs. If they're, you know, if you have to pick one that it's not uh, a grabber the first, you know, first times around. But the thing about Hosanna is it was the first song title we heard. Yes. About this album, so I had all these great expectations for it that it was this tremendous song, and it turns out to be this really nice ballad. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's probably going to take a little bit longer for 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 me to to appreciate it. Mark Ronson was the one that that mentioned it, and, and Ronson gave it a a big big uh, review. And then it turns out that it's you know it's the, it's what it is, and you know but you keep saying it's what it is. What it is could be a really nice ballad. Well, yeah, but... Uh, but It could have its merits, you know. You understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and I do love I Can Bet. I Can Bet is one of the catchiest songs on the album. It is. And um, it does have somewhat of a Wings feel to it. Mm-hmm. And um, really, I just... It, that's definitely a different sound for him. I mean, his his vocals are compressed and all, but... Um, just the structure of the song, and it's you know it's still a catchy song, which he's just so skillful at doing. It's one of those songs that I could see as a single. Mm-hmm. Looking at her, I do love a lot. It's really grown on me. Like I, I said, gave that one a, I gave that one a B. Uh, I I I liked it. I uh, it wasn't the front line of the album as far as I was concerned, but I I, did, I liked it. Yeah, it's one that's going to sneak on you, you know, mm-hmm. and it, and all of a sudden it's going to grab you. It's like wow, I really like that song. Probably, I think "Road," the next song "Road" is more of more the grab or, or more the under the radar song. Yeah, um, well, I did say I do think that it sounds more like an electric electric argument song, and mm-hmm. it just has more of an experimental feel. Melodically, it doesn't go where you would expect it to go. It does sound very different for him. Mm-hmm. Well, different, <laughs> still similar to the Fireman album there, but still, I like the fact that it's not predictable. You right. know, it doesn't go where you expect it to go. Then there's Turned Out, which I love. That's a gem. Turned Out is, is definitely, if you want a Wings-ish type song, and it does remind you of Wings when you listen to that song, especially the harmonies. It has a real Wings sound to it. Mm-hmm. Um, very catchy tune, you know, real nice surprise as a bonus track. And I do like Get Me Out of Here, like you said, because of that blues feel that Paul gives to it. And then they're Scared which uh, I think is an absolute gem. Mm -hmm. It's a real nice surprise. Mm -hmm. It should be mentioned, I mean, everybody's got the album now, so they all know, but um, Rusty Anderson, Brian Ray, Abel Boreal Jr., and and, uh, Paul Paul Wickens appear on seven tracks, which I think is significant in itself because that hasn't happened. Um, He hasn't used them as much on his more recent albums than, as he did with this one. And I think that's a good that's a good move. I well, they're on, they're on half of Memory Almost Full. Okay. So, yeah. But they've, he's never really used them as his band for an entire album. Right. And I think what Paul goes through, he's very much an in-the-moment type of guy. Mm-hmm. 
if he's in the studio and he's with Paul Epworth, and from what I understand, the songs that he created with him, a lot of it was uh, very spontaneous, you know, throwing ideas at each other. And Paul Epworth himself played drums on those songs. Right. The only musicians on the songs with Paul Epworth are the two Pauls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if he can play drums, and, and Paul can play all the other instruments, he can, Paul can play anything, you know that, why not go with it? And he also so, recorded it at six studios, including his own, hmm. which uh, which is another interesting thing. Um, he was at Abbey Road. He was at Air. I love the fact that he was at Henson, because that's the former A&M studios in downtown L.A., and Henson Studios are where John and George both recorded, too. So, hmm. And Sean Lennon. And Sean Lennon, yeah. Yeah. But uh, just the final thing about Scared... I love that song a lot because very rarely do you get to see Paul do a song where it's basically just the piano and nothing else, almost nothing else. There's a xylophone on this one. But it's got such a warm, haunting feel when you do that. There are times when, and it's very rare, when Paul will go to the piano and just you don't have any other accompaniment. And those are rare moments. I'd love to hear more of just Paul alone mm -hmm. <laughs> on the piano. What's, what's what's interesting about this song is the bare emotion. Yeah, and it's it's kind of uh, it's in contrast to the rest of the album because rest of the album is all him being you know him being Paul the musician, whereas Scared is Paul the person. Hmm. And that's a very interesting. It's a very interesting contrast. Well, there are those moments, and there's a key word here that uh, Paul has brought up when he's been interviewed when discussing Ethan Johns and the song Early Days, mm -hmm. because what he had said was um, he had this new song, he wanted to play it for him, he went into the studio, played Early Days, it was like a one-take thing, and Paul didn't sound all that good, his voice was kind of wobbly, you know, at the very beginning his voice kind of cracks a little, and he wanted to redo that, and Ethan said, no, leave it. It's you, it's real, it shows your vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So that key word there, vulnerable, it's kind of like, it's real. It's who he is. You know? And when you're used to Paul the perfectionist, <laughs> you know, and having the greatest, I think he's probably the greatest singer of all time, in my estimation. <laughs> I really do believe that. He's, oh, I know you do. You know, he's, he's, he's completely underrated as a singer. He's done so many different types of voices. So many different types of deliveries, whether it's a ballad, whether it's something, a rocker, something like a Monkbury Moon Delight, where he's, you know, how can you possibly compare those vocals to, you know, it's one of the toughest things ever to sing. Right. <laughs> or Oh Darling or Helter Skelter or those songs. And he's done lower range songs. He's done falsetto songs. He's just extremely versatile in everything that he does. That's true. And... People don't give him enough credit as a vocalist. You know, they talk no, about think, him being. No, I, I, I disagree with you there. I think he's gotten. I think he's gotten tons of credit, and I. I, I well, I don't hear it. Well, I mean, the fact that he's done uh, songs in the style of Little Richard, for example, and and he's held his own. I mean, that, right. That you know, uh, he. I mean, he was always a very versatile vocalist. Everybody, that was always the case that has mm. never been no i don't think anybody has ever questioned his vocal talents i mean of all the uh, of all the beatles i think he's the one that's gotten you know his vocals have been the most uh celebrated and so i wouldn't i, wouldn't I don't know i don't know whenever i see polls music polls of the greatest rock singers i see john lennon up there i don't really see paul's name up there hmm. well i the mean the ones I, that the ones that i've looked at Okay. You know, John definitely was one of the greatest rock singers ever. Great, greatest rock singers ever. So was Paul. But Paul is certainly much more versatile. I think, yeah, Paul, and Paul definitely is much more versatile. I don't think there's any, there's any question. That's not to just John. No. John was a great singer in his own right. But I think, especially in the Beatle days, um, when you go through all the BBC stuff, there's no question that, that Paul had things like Clarabella... Lucille. Um, you don't need just the BBC stuff. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just you know, I'm just pulling yeah, those titles right. out of, you know, till there was you. Uh, how who could have gotten away with that? 
Uh, I, I mean, we're, we're going outside the, the box here, but right. I mean, who could have gotten away with doing that? Even uh, you know, in '64, and in when he when he did it uh, on tour, um, you know, more recently. I mean, he's the only one that could have gotten away with that. Mm. But, but anyway, uh, as far as this album is concerned, it not only showcases different styles of music, but the different vocal styles of Paul. His okay. voice, he does a lot of different things with his voice here. That's true. Well, how would you grade it? I think it's still too soon to grade it. You know, <laughs> I've really, I mean, I've only had a week here, and even though I've listened to it a lot, you do need some time to distance yourself from the album. Because right now I've got all these songs in my head, and I'll probably give it a better rating than I might three months from now. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't really know. You need, you need to just sit back, relax, take some time. <laughs> you know, I always remember, I have this, this friend of mine who's probably the biggest George Harrison fan I've ever met. And when Brainwash came out, the day that it was released, he called me up, best album he's ever done since All Things Must Pass. And I'm saying, wait a minute, calm down. <laughs> take some time. Listen to it for a while. And I'm not knocking Brainwashed in any way because I love the album, but, you know, you can't judge an album that quickly. No, that's that's definitely true. I will say, though, that I think, again, as I, as I said at the beginning of the program, I think this album will have more than its share of memorable cuts down the line. In other words, it, it'll have uh, several songs that people will go back to. Well, Steve, I could have said that about a lot of McCartney albums. That didn't happen. Well, I think so, in this case it will. I'm I'm predicting. I'm going I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that. I think there are, I think there are. I think right now this this album sounds very solid to me. And I will definitely say that it's a very good album. I won't go as far as calling it great yet. I might say that a few months from now mm-hmm. when I've had more time to just soak it all in. I had somebody had somebody on Facebook compare it to Pepper, and I said, no, I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> um, I don't like comparing it to anything in particular. Well, you know, especially, this is... especially an album with the reputation of Pepper, I don't think you want to, you don't want to do that. But I think it's, it, you know, in the, initially in the long span of Paul McCartney solo albums, I think this will be in the, in the upper group as opposed to the lower group. Okay. It but may, we'll see. It may I mean, well. obviously we'll see. I'm trying not to be play political here and, you know, and dance around the, the issue. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm serious about that. Mm-hmm. But you know, we're not going to know for a while yet. I always frown on people who think that they can judge an album after one listen. And I know in the case of you and me, it's been more than one listen, obviously. But there are people that I come across who seem to think that they know how they're going to feel about a particular work after one listen. Like for the rest of their lives, they're always going to feel the same way. And it's just not realistic. With every major artist out there, there are some uh, bodies of work of theirs that you go back to more frequently than others. Mm -hmm. And Paul is no exception. You know, there are certain albums of his that I go back to more than others that I think are absolute masterpieces. And I still feel that way to this day. But it takes a while before you feel that way. So I think Paul has released great music in every decade since the Beatles. And, of course, during the Beatle years, too. But um, it's spread out over so many decades now. And he continues to put out really strong material, which is what impresses me more than anything else, is the fact that he he still has this enthusiasm to make music as well as to go out and perform. And it still excites him to go into a studio and write new material and come up with whatever he does. And I can just sense that this particular album sounds like he had a lot of fun. And working with different people, different producers in particular, can only benefit you because it brings out another side in you or it's a different way of producing or you know, a whole different approach in the way that you go about recording whatever it is that you're doing. It's like, yeah, I mean, this is the way that, I mean, this is something that we could probably talk about, you know, over and over again. Because when you're somebody like Paul McCartney, is it you producing, is it them producing you or you telling them what to do? Mm -hmm. And apparently, at least from the interviews, you know, Paul did give them some leeway, which is interesting, uh, you know, on its own. I'm sure it's a combination of both, but Paul always does have the final say. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like we've, we've talked about electric arguments. I mean, that whole approach of doing everything from scratch and coming up with new songs on the spot, that was something that he felt like doing at the time. And it was refreshing for him and, you know, stimulating as an artist. And you need to have different ways to create. And so working with different people helps you to do that. And that's why Paul kind of bounces around and works with different producers. Because it might bring out something inside of him, or something in him as an artist that other producers wouldn't. Right. And that's what you do when you collaborate, whether it's with a producer or with a songwriter or another musician. They can bring out something in you that others haven't before. So I really think this is a strong album. And like I said, I will definitely at least call it very good. Whether I will call it on a scale of 0 to 10 a 10, I don't know yet. <laughs> I've got seven McCartney albums that are tens, so I will take uh, a f you know some time before I fully rate this album. But from where I'm standing right now, after ten listens, it's really good. And I, I mean, I I'm been you know that's what surprised me the most about this is that Paul McCartney. I mean, the recent albums, even Chaos, which I know you really like, Love, Love, okay didn't really knock me over. I, I, I mean, one album that did knock me over was Tug of War. I love Tug of War. Absolutely. That's adore. one of my favorites, too. And, and, um, and I'm not saying that new is, is to that point yet, because it's, you know, it's too new. It's too it's new. Too new. <laughs> but it's, got, it's, it's starting out well. That's, that's, the, big, that's the big thing. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's our review so far of new. It might be interesting if we get some guests here on the show and then they give their own opinion, too. That's true. That's very true. All right, so that brings this show to a close. Hope you enjoyed our discussion of Paul McCartney's new album. I'm Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today, saying thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today. Enjoy new, and we will see you next time.